Thank you so much. That was a beautiful introduction, Ashley. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> I happen to complain that I hate it when people just read the thing that you have printed. Um, so she was really trying to say something from the heart. And, and to me, that means a lot, because then I feel like, actually, you, you know me before I have to stand up. It seems to be like a good icebreaker. <clears throat> so um, neighbor like you mean it, of course, um, comes from the Bible. And in the Gospel of Luke, um, there is this, the famous parable of the Good Samaritan. And so this is taken from Wikipedia, just a short, brief introduction. Now, behold, a certain lawyer, this is the World English Bible, Luke 10, 25, 29. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? I think this is the most important question facing the world today, who is my neighbor? Jesus replies with a story, because of course this was Jesus' way of teaching by indirection and forcing us to, to ponder and to look into our own hearts. Jesus answered, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who both stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. By chance, a certain priest was going down that way. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he traveled, came where he was. When he saw him, he was moved with compassion, came to him, bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii and gave them to the host and said to him, take care of him. Whatever you spend beyond that, I will repay you when I return. Now which of these three do you think seemed to be a neighbor to him who fell among the robbers? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. It, it, it is this story that I, I think is so important for us to understand. And um, Jesus said, which of these three do you think seemed to be a neighbor to him who fell among the robbers? But, but this is a Samaritan, right? When preachers preach on this parable, they talk about the fact that, that the Samaritans and the Jews weren't friendly with each other. In fact, they, they may have hated each other. It's somewhat lost in time, but that's what I gather from the ministers I know, that, that these were warring groups. Yet the Samaritan stopped to help the man who'd been beaten. And this is a profound thought. The, the second part of this is that this, the, the guy was lying by the road and people went by. They, they didn't live next door to each other. They weren't from the same tribe. He was just passing by. And, and therefore, I think this asks us to reflect on two things. One is that a neighbor is not somebody that we are predisposed to love. We might be predisposed to love them or we might not. A neighbor is somebody with whom we have propinquity. They're there next to us. Our neighbor is next to us. The man was in the road and the Samaritan came by and therefore he was a neighbor. He was next to him. It is this next to that in the American system of segregation and division by race and class and religion and sex and age that becomes so difficult because once we have segregated our society, we're not next to people who aren't like us and it seems easy to say, I don't have to think about them. But we, in the, in the larger understanding that there's one ecosystem and one world, we are always next to each other. And so what I want to talk to you about today is the ways in which our society, by pursuing a process that historian Tom Hanchett has called sorting out the city, has divided us so that we're, aren't, we're not next to each other anymore. And this has caused harms on all of us and made our society rather dysfunctional. 
This is a beautiful monument by the State House in Columbia, South Carolina, which you may have seen. And it's kind of a um, depiction of African American history. So it begins with Africa and the slave trade and the Civil War and emancipation and then Jim Crow and the Great Migration and then the Civil Rights Movement. And it ends with an astronaut. And I, I think that if we just depict that in another way, in the black experience, as we often do it in shorthand, we talk about slavery and abolition and reconstruction and Jim Crow and the migration and the civil rights movement. And then the question hangs over the heads of all of us, so why isn't life perfect? We have a black astronaut. In fact, if they were going to remake the monument, they'd have a black president. So it's even more perfect, right? No. What else happened? The, the world around us is, I think, where we have to look for the answer to why isn't life perfect? What else happened in the world around us? This famous architect, J. Marston Fitch, who wrote this book called American Building, pointed out that buildings do work for us. You know we have a balcony up there? Hi. <laughs> the nosebleed sleets. <laughs> Um, the, so this room is doing work for us. It's very hot outside. If we had to sit outside, you would not want to listen to me. I mean, you're very polite people, so you might, but it would, we'd all be trying to figure out how to do this. But here it's 75, it's very comfortable, we can relax, I can take my time. I don't have to rush through this so that we don't die of heat exhaustion. This room is working for us. And it's its height and splendor give us a sense that not only are we here together, but we're here together in a splendid place, honors a president of the United States. It's fitting to be in such a place. And we feel good about ourselves. We feel good about each other because we are here, cool, comfortable, noble. That's a lot of work for a space to do. Spaces do that for us. Our environment does that kind of work for us. <clears throat> this is a fundamental proposition in public health. And um, are there many students of public health here today besides Ashley? Oh, right. <laughs> faculty. I, I thought you might be faculty, but don't want to have ageism because we can go back to school at any age, right? Um, th this, is a, this is a very famous map in public health and is one of those maps that's shown in every course. Every professor has a reason to show this map. If you're teaching history of public health, you have to show this map. If you're teaching epidemiology, you have to show this map. If you're teaching cholera, you have to show this map. If you're teaching urban space, as I do, you have to show this map. Very famous map. This is a map from 1848 in London of a neighborhood where there was a terrible cholera outbreak. And John Snow, who was the an a big anesthesiologist and physician to Queen Victoria, went around and counted the deaths. And he made little slash marks. And you'll notice that right here, there are the most. That's where the most deaths were. And you'll notice that there's, a, it says pump, P-U-M-P, -P, right there on Broad Street. And he reasoned that there was something about the water. They, we didn't have germ theory in 1848. He's there was something about the water that was wrong at that spot to be causing everybody to die. And he did an amazing thing. He went and took the handle off the Broad Street pump. And the cholera epidemic stopped. Now it turns out that the cholera epidemic was going to stop and it wasn't exactly what he thought, but he was pretty close to the truth and his method of looking at where the problem was is something that has inspired generations of public health professionals, me among them. In fact, what we understand now is that cleaning up the environment is the foundation of health. This is especially the day after the Supreme Court says we can have universal health care and people can be asked to pay. So we've all been talking about paying for health care. So access to hospitals and doctors is something we've been told is what gives us health. In fact, it's called health care. But <clears throat> those of us who are more curmudgeon that would be me. Uh, that, that's not what gives us health care. That's disease management, which is useful if you have a disease. But it's not what gives us health. 
which is an interesting thing. And all, all, everybody in public health will tell you this. 90% of what gives us health has nothing to do with going to the doctor and getting health care. And one of the great demonstrations of this is that here's a vaccine. These are all vaccines, right? There's no vaccine for scarlet fever. Whooping cough fell before we had a vaccine. Diphtheria fell before we had a vaccine. Measles fell before we had a vaccine. Why are all these diseases going away before we have vaccines, before we have antibiotics, if healthcare is the key? And it turns out the answer is that we cleaned up the environment. We got clean water, we've got decent housing, we got better working conditions. Huge, huge movement of urban reform around the turn of the 20th century, around 100 years ago, that improved the housing, cleaned up the milk, that's when we got the Pure Food and Drug Act. We did a lot of things to say, we have to live together in a good way. We have to get the sewage out of the cities efficiently. We have to get clean water. We have to get clean water to everybody. Can't just a few people have clean water. They all have to have clean water. And so it was this cleaning up of the environment that knocked all these diseases out of the box and created great health, the, the health that we benefit from today. That's astounding, right? It's not. And people in public health, the Institute of Medicine has released a series of reports to point out that even if we get this disease management money, we've still got to prevent disease. We'll never have enough money to treat all the diseases that it's possible to have. Never have that much money. So we've got to prevent as many diseases as we possibly can. That's our job. Well, how do we do that? So the environment is really two parts. It's the place, which includes things like, do you have a sewer system? Do you have fire battalions? Do you have code in inspections so you have decent housing? And it's the people and how they live together, what we commonly think of as community. Community is people helping Ashley's neighbor who said, you could use my parking space. This is an example of, a, of community. Communities do work for us. They help us in the same way that this building does work for us. Our communities do work for us. They keep us going, keep us strong. But communities, in order to do work, have to be knit together. Community is a kind of fabric. And in my field, social psychiatry, when it's knit together, we call it integrated. Slightly different from when we talk about racial segregation or integration, we call it integrated. And at the other end, we call it disintegrated. Imagine a scarf that you want to put around your neck in winter. If it's all falling to pieces, it's not going to keep the cold out. But if it's a nice, tight-knit scarf and you put it around your neck, you're going to feel great. Uh, you all might not have as much snow as we have in New Jersey, so this might not be the best thing. <laughs> Imagine it's a really hot day and you want to fan yourself, but there's holes in the fan. It's not going to do the work. But imagine a fan that's nice and tight. It's going to move the air and cool you off. That might be a better. There is one phrase that will tell you immediately how people are feeling about their community. And that is, it's very familiar to most people, that if people say, where I grew up or where I live, all the adults look after all the children. So people say, you know, when I was growing up, if you did something bad, the neighbor would call your mother, and the neighbor could punish you. You know for sure that that was a tight-knit community. If people say, we're afraid to talk to the children these days because they have a lot of attitude, we don't know if they're going to be violent, we're afraid of them, you know that you're in a community that has fallen apart. And when people feel afraid, they retreat, and they start talking about, I, I have to go in my house, I have to have a burglar alarm, I have to live in a gated community, I can't be, I, I don't know my neighbors, so it becomes I. When people live in a strong community, what you feel is the we. We thought we didn't have enough shade trees, so we planted some more. We made a party for the children because we wanted them to have a good time. Of course, I always have every child that's in the neighborhood who's at my house at dinner time. If you're at my house, of course you sit down and have dinner. I once visited a community, um, the remains of a community in um, Madison, Wisconsin. And it was a community that had been Italian and Jewish and black. And they talked proudly about the fact that whosever house you were at at dinner time, that's where you ate. So that's, that's a strong community. Communities that can welcome all the kids on the block. 
into any house. All the kids know they're safe wherever they go. That's a strong community. Such communities as that are, are the true deep foundation of health. Because a community that can work together, that has confidence, people have confidence in each other, whatever problems they have, they're going to talk to each other and they're going to find a solution. Say, for example, there's a, a tight-knit community, but there's a break-in on the block. People will say, people will get together at a neighbor's house and say, perhaps we ought to form a block watch. And they will, or, or perhaps we should have a patrol. Or, you know, it's nothing we really need to worry about. It's so-and-so's nephew who's a problem, and let's bring him in and sit him down and talk to him, and then he never does that again. Any community that presents, any community that's tight-knit can solve problems to the best of its ability. That is actually, as human beings, the only tool that we have for making the future. If you think about the 21st century, it's full of uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen with global warming. We don't know what's going to happen with unemployment and this deep recession that we're having trouble getting out of. We don't know what's going to happen with anything. What we can know for sure is that our neighbors, the people who are next to us, are going to work with us to name the problems and to solve them, that we're going to be together. Whatever comes, come what may, we're in it together. That's what we can know for sure. And that is the true foundation of human health. Now, sadly, we've been in a system that hasn't invested in that. So neighborhoods are obviously one type of community, and they're very important because we all you live somewhere, you live in a neighborhood. There are many communities in every neighborhood, but everybody who lives in a neighborhood is part of the community of that neighborhood. There's a, a remarkable, remarkable photographer named Teeny Harris, who worked for the Pittsburgh Courier, an African-American newspaper that was located in the Hill District of Pittsburgh, a very, very, very famous African-American neighborhood. And he, uh, I think he had unlimited film. It was before the digital age, so, you know, but he worked for a newspaper, so they paid for his film. Took 80,000 photos of the neighborhood. Now today, you take 80,000 photos in an afternoon with our digital cameras, right? It's no big deal. But he had a speed graphic, one of those big cameras, and he would walk up to a scene, you know, the flashbulb, pop the flashbulb in, take the shot, and walk away. He was called one shot because President Roosevelt came to town, President Kennedy came to town, he would take one shot. It's slight exaggeration, a bit seen in the archives, two shots of a lot of things, but. <laughs> now, the other thing that's remarkable about Teeny Harris is he was interested in everything. So you know how Diane Arbus only takes pictures of people who look strange? Was, you know, or other people, Richard Avedon only takes pictures of people who are beautiful. Teeny Harris was interested in everybody. So he had pictures of the gamblers, he had pictures of the transvestites, he had pictures of the Girl Scouts, he had pictures of the deer hunters who on a certain day would go hunting deer and bring back the venison so everybody could have a big feast in the neighborhood. He had pictures of parades, he had pictures of police busts, he had pictures of murders, he had pictures of the swimming pool, everything. And so this is one of his pictures. By the time you've looked at 80,000 photographs of a neighborhood, you feel like you got to know the neighborhood. They just did a retrospective at the Carnegie Museum of Art in Pittsburgh where they showed 1,000 of his photographs arranged by year. And it, it was just extraordinary. It was such an interesting place. People did so many different kinds of things in that neighborhood. But this photo I love because I think that it represents community. And, and the reason that I think this is such a, a classic, iconic, important photo is that, first of all, it's taken on the steps of the Carnegie Library. Carnegie built a lot of libraries all over the nation and many in Pittsburgh. This is the Carnegie Library in the Hill. But if you think about what does it take to make a marching band, a marching band is really good symbol of a community working together. Because you have to teach people how to play the instruments. You have to teach some people how to be uh, dancing, right? And baton twirling. You have to, somebody's buying all this stuff. You have to have outfits. Somebody has to plan the outfits. You have to practice marching. And you have to have an audience. Who wants to have a marching band and nobody comes to see you? The, 
one of the things that people told me when I was interviewing people in the Hill for my book Root Shock was, did you just, there was just always a parade going on. Anytime you got bored, you went outside, there was a parade. Amazing. This is a great urban neighborhood. Another photo that I love, I don't know if you've ever seen Rembrandt's Night Watch. Um, for some reason, I find this photo very reminiscent of Rembrandt's Night Watch. Just sort of men kind of sculpturally arranged, very connected to each other, very wise. Um, this tells you so much about the environment. It, think of, I was saying before, we wouldn't want to sit outside in the 104 degree heat and listen to me. They would not be sitting there if there were guns going off and it was the middle of the crack epidemic. Do you see how peaceful they are, how serious that is? Uh, the, they're playing high level, they're not me playing checkers. That's not me playing checkers. These are serious checkers players. That's real concentration. That guy is deadly. <laughs> Do I lie? You know he is. They're kind of, I mean, you don't have a move like that unless you can pull it off, right? <laughs> he would just be laughed out of the place. And look at how all these people watching. This is real entertainment. That's a fabulous urban neighborhood, uh, really fabulous. But we know that in the American system of racism, this was not seen as a fabulous urban neighborhood. This was seen as a blighted slum. And by blight, they meant a cancer, something that was eating away at the fabric of our city. But these were undesirable racial elements that were killing America, and they needed to be gotten rid of. The way we get rid of cancer, we take a Big, we scoop it out, right? That's how we get rid of them. You take a nice margin all around the edge. You take the whole cancer. You gotta get rid of the whole, you can't leave some cancer behind. I guess you can't leave some black people behind either. That's kind of the problem that's been going on in the American city. So this issue of, of you know, what do you do with these undesirable racial elements who are this, who are the cancer, right? It's the cancer is the black people, the Jewish people, the foreigners, the poor. We are the cancer. What do you do with it? And it turns out there's been a very long series of policies about what to do with the undesirable racial element, which has included segregation and redlining and urban renewal and highway construction and catastrophic disinvestment and deindustrialization and destruction of housing projects and gentrification and the subprime lending crisis, all of which have moved because we don't actually, you know, we cut out the cancer and we throw it in the garbage. We don't actually do that with people. What we do with people is we bulldoze the neighborhoods and put them someplace that you don't care about at the time. It's very much like what we did with the Native Americans. So in the Native Americans in the 1800s, we said, well, why don't you move by the Mississippi? And then when white settlers got to the Mississippi, they said, well, yeah, why don't you move on the other side of the Mississippi? Then when we went on the other side of the Mississippi, we said, well, why don't you move in the Great Plains? Then when we got to the Great Plains, we said, this is good farming land and you all don't farm, so why don't you go over there? and we put them in deserts, basically. It's one of those great ironies of history that we put them in places with this mucky black stuff, which turned out to be oil. But then there's another irony, which is that then we set up a gas and oil trust for the oil that was found on Native American lands and people stole the money. Why? Is there no, there's no respite from this. There's, it, it, which is really the point of my story about neighboring um, there's no respite from these problems. So this is the series of problems. First of all, segregation, we all know what that is, but it, go, it has a long history. Segregation really starts in Italy 500 years ago when Jews were segregated into the ghetto. And the name ghetto is an Italian word, and it's about making members of a group live together. So we think of ghettos as slums and ghettos nowadays, the word ghetto is used to mean slum, but that's not really its, its origin. Because very rich Jews had to live in the ghetto and black, very rich black people had to live in the ghetto. So it's about your membership in a group, or it traditionally has been. Um, so in Pittsburgh, this is um, a map of seg black segregated areas in 1930. 
I want you to watch this little point here because that's going to be a lot of action there. Um, so the next big policy that comes down the pike is redlining. A policy instituted by the U.S. government, they actually sent people out to 200 American cities to map the cities in 1937. And they were really explicitly looking to see if where did poor people live, where did black people live, where did foreigners live, where were they trying to move to? And they explicitly looked at were black people or foreign people or Jewish people encroaching or infiltrating white areas. And the reason they wanted to know that is that because that posed a risk to the, to the integrity of the financial value of the area. You know, when people say, oh, black people are moving in, there goes the property values, it's not a joke. That's really what the red lining map said. If black people move into your area, you, your property values are going to go down. It's really literally what they surveyed. It's an astounding, astounding thing. But, but think about it. Think about, think about the Good Samaritan. So here's a neighborhood that's poor, that's full of minority people, foreigners, people who've just arrived in America, probably don't speak English very well, people trying to make it, but they don't have much assets. And what do you decide to do? You decide that it's not a good idea to give them loans, or if you're going to give them loans, you're going to try them, give them higher interest, because they're a risk. And who are you going to give the best loans to? The wealthy people. Well, well what, what sense does that make to make it harder for the poor neighborhoods to support themselves and to make it easier for the rich neighborhoods to support themselves? In, in one system, if you only think about the bankers, okay, that's a fine idea for the bankers, but what about the health of the public? If this strong integrated foundation of society is what creates health for all of us, we have just gone so profoundly off in the wrong direction that we don't know when we're ever going to catch up. And that's the situation we are in today. We put the banker's money ahead of the common good. We acted like the priest who walked by on the other side and the Levite who also walked by on the other side. We didn't act like the Good Samaritan. We didn't say our neighbors are in trouble. They don't have much money. They don't speak English. They're new to the city. How do we help them get a good break? We didn't do that. We didn't stop and put oil on their wounds. We didn't set them on our ride and take them to the inn. We didn't say, here's two denarii, nurse them back to health, and if you need more money, I'll give you more money. We did the opposite. Um, so this is a redlining map. Urban renewal was about going into those areas where the undesirable racial elements had been located on the redlining maps and scooping them out. And that's what they did. So this is how they designed urban renewal in Pittsburgh. This is the, so this is the Hill District. So, you know, this is where the guys are sitting and playing checkers. And, you know, Carnegie Library is over here. They're going to scoop all this out. They're going to put in a civic arena and they're going to put in a lot of highways that are going to cut off the black neighborhood from downtown. This is the, a photo by Teeny Harris of what it looked like during the demolition. He has a whole series of the demolition that are, are just heartbreaking. And in the exhibit at the Carnegie, it was even more heartbreaking because you had just gone year by year through the glories of the neighborhood. All the people at play, the families and children, Easter finery, the, the children painting. You had seen so many glorious things about this neighborhood that then to watch it be demolished was just heartbreaking. So this is a, the Civic Arena, which looks a good deal like a spaceship. And actually, the architect who designed it was thinking about spaceships in, in his preliminary designs. Um, and these are the highways. Now, you can see that they've actually created um, three systems of barriers between the African-American community and downtown. One is a spaceship. Because if you think about America in the 1950s, how did we feel about spaceships? Right? They might come and take you away, do strange experiments on you. 
I mean, you didn't, I mean, think about, think about the movie 2001, right? Most people were not trying to run up to the spaceship. The crazy people were trying to run up to the spaceship. The other people were like, I think I'll go the other direction. It might be safer. You know, letting the aliens take you was not considered a good idea. The second thing is they put in highways, and then the third thing is parking lots. Man, any time you want to just stop people from walking, put in a parking lot. If you ever have the need to do that, take it from me, 100% guaranteed success. Put in a parking lot between two things and nobody will walk there. Now, remember I told you to look at the point. So this is that same a series of maps about racial segregation in Pittsburgh. So this was a black segregated area, but now it's not. It's not a black segregated area anymore because the undesirable racial element, it's all been bulldozed. They're all moved. And where are they moved? They're moved to the other segregated areas. Over here, over, over other parts of the hill, and over here to the north side. Now, a massive urban renewal project gets carried out here, and another massive one gets carried out there. So I defined root shock, as Ashley told you, as the traumatic stress reaction to the loss of all or part of one's emotional ecosystem. This is a very interesting photo for two reasons. Um, one is that, that um, this woman's face is the, the true picture of what I think of as root shock. Just the, the stress, the strain, the terror, the, 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 the trying to hold on. She's perfectly clear, even if she couldn't articulate it, that she's about to lose that which she loves. People are extremely inarticulate. They don't have language for the idea that I don't just live in my body, I don't just live in my house, I don't just live in my yard, I live in the world in a big way. But a particular way. I live in my neighborhood, I live in my job, I live in the restaurants I like to go to, I live in the library I like to go to, if you like to come here for lectures, you live here. It's very particular. And it has Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's mapped out. That's how you live, period. That's how you live. That's how we live. All of us live this way. It's our security blanket. It's very large. It's very complicated. It's very personal. When you lose your home, you lose the center of that. When you lose your neighborhood, you lose the core of what makes the world make sense to you. If you walk up to somebody and say, if you lost your neighborhood tomorrow, how would you feel? They're not gonna tell you, oh, I'm gonna lose the core of what makes the world make sense to me. They're not gonna tell you that. But they're gonna start to look sad and perplexed. Like, oh, I love my neighborhood. I wouldn't wanna lose my neighborhood. They might not know why. If you had asked her, she couldn't say why. She's in terror. But when you look at pictures, I found a photograph, not a photograph, a lithograph, from Paris in 18, I think it's 1860, when they were doing urban renewal in Paris, and the artist captured the exact same expression on the woman's face. And we happened to come across a photo of a, of a fireman after 9-11, exact same expression. This is what people look like confronted with that enormity of loss. It's, it, it's literally gut-wrenching. The opposite of this, which is what I really hope that you'll take home with you, it's like the take home message of today, is that the preciousness of this big thing is life giving. Having a neighbor who'll say, you can use my parking space, that's life giving. A neighbor who'll water your plants. My granddaughter has a pet ferret. So she's at camp for the summer, so I'm in charge of the ferret. I'm here in Little Rock. Our neighbor is taking care of the ferret. Right? A neighbor will take care of your ferret. That's a very precious thing. <laughs> a ferret is a weird pet. Not everybody wants to take care of our ferret. She's right not to take this lightly. See how they're arguing with her? You gotta go. She's like, no. No. This is wrong. And she's right. She's right. So, I made a, a list, actually um, did a thing called The Price of the Commons. It's a small report that I did after I did my book, Root Chalk, and I did it for the Institute of Justice, which has been fighting um, eminent domain abuse. And I, and I thought, you know what I really want people to understand is 
what are all the losses? Because a lot of times people say, here's a check for your house if somebody happens to own a house. Or we're going to give you relocation money. I'm like, no. Do you know those MasterCards ads? You know, you, you paid for the baseball tickets and you paid for the soda and you paid for the popcorn and the hot dogs, but the time you had together was priceless. So I thought people really need to know what I've heard from the hundreds of people I've interviewed about what did they lose. So first of all, it's always an unfair offer for the old home because the, the, the new neighborhood is going to get a higher value, but they're going to pay you at the old value, so it's always unfair. The second is that there's the loss of the sentimental value of the home. If you've lived in your home for more than a minute, and I do mean a minute, it has sentimental value to you. There's emotional turmoil. There is a massive loss of the collective things that we have. We make organizations together. We make culture together. We make politics together. And we, all of those collective things are lost. There's a permanent exile from the old place. You can never go back because the old place doesn't exist. And this sets up a psychic dissonance that people cannot escape. People said, my center ice at the Civic Arena where the Pittsburgh Penguins said, center ice is over my house. They can't go watch a hockey game without feeling like, guys, you're starting a hockey game by my, on my house. On my house, right? It's like when the house falls on the Wicked Witch of the West, right? Only it's the opposite. So here's the question. Urban renewal was bad, and it caused all these losses. But I've already told you that that wasn't the only policy that caused upheaval or displaced African Americans, other minorities, and poor people in the 20th century. So the question that our research group has tackled is, so what happens if you repeat it? Cause people all of those losses, let them get settled someplace, and then do it again. So I want you to just keep that in mind. So the next policy that has been of tremendous importance is, is a policy called planned shrinkage. This is the one they talk about a lot lately, because they're proposing to do it in Youngstown and Detroit and other cities that they call shrinking cities. So they say we have to plan the shrinkage. Disastrous policy. And in New York City, when they tried this, they triggered the AIDS epidemic. And basically, the AIDS epidemic in New York triggered the worldwide AIDS epidemic. Millions of deaths. This is the most ridiculous policy out there. Um, this is what planned shrinkage looks like. So there's a, every service is taken out, and all the money is taken out. People have recently, because we're all fat, people have recently, well, I know you might not be, but I am, and a um, other, few other people are. Um, we become aware that there are places that are food deserts. I did a master's in nutrition in 1974 in a place that was a food desert. So this is not news. The point is not just that these places are food deserts. They're deserts of garbage pickup. They're deserts, obviously, of home improvement loans. They're deserts of, of protection against alcohol and other drugs. They're just deserts because we took out all the investment, catastrophic disinvestment. Everything was taken out. So people were like, well, let's put in a grocery store. You have to put in everything. You can't just put in a grocery store. You have to put in a bank. You have to put in a grocery store. You have to put in arts programs for youth. You have to put in summer camp. You have to put in decent schools. You have to put in, hey, garbage pickup, fire services, loans. These are red line places. Look at that. That's redlining. You can't get any money to fix up your house. And this is Pittsburgh, so this is the middle hill where people move from the area that was demolished. And you can see there's no garbage pickup. Without investment, without serious, sustained investment all the time, houses fall down. I defy you to show me a building that can go for 50 years without investment and that's still standing in good shape. It doesn't happen. You have to invest continuously if you want your property to be in good shape. And everyone in here who's got, who, whether you're a renter or a homeowner, you know that if you're a renter, you want the landlord to be fixing it up continuously. And if you're a homeowner, you're doing that yourself. That's what it takes. If you can't get home loans, your property's going to fall down. And lo and behold, it does. They also took out fire services, which sped up the process of collapse. And this is what's happened in America's inner cities. And so just to show, this is Newark, New Jersey. 
I have photos like this from every, basically every American city I've ever visited. We allowed this. This is, this is a quarter of a mile from Penn Station in Newark, downtown Newark. This is a photograph taken by a photographer named Helen Stummer, and it's called Hermineo taking clothes home to his mother in their cardboard shack. That's where they live. How heartbreaking is that? A, a, a child. I was asked to speak at a conference, um, and it was called A Flower Grows Through Concrete, and it was about the resilience of children. And the idea was that this kid who's living in the cardboard shack is so resilient that he'll keep going even though he's been living in a cardboard shack. And I stood up and I said, I hate to be the contrarian, you know, but sometimes it happens that you have to do that, right? I stood up and I said, I just got a certificate in landscape design from the New York Botanical Garden. And I'm going to show you 10 websites about preparing soil. And it doesn't say throw the seeds on concrete. I was like, yeah, it makes you feel good that there's this one flower, one flower. But we don't want one flower. We want every child to have a good future. We want, I mean, I'm, this is, I know this is a garden city. I don't even know you people. I haven't even seen your city. I know it's a garden city. I know you love flowers. You don't want one flower. Who wants one flower? You want a profusion. <laughs> you want a lot. You want azaleas and rhododendrons and roses and daisies, all those things. Tulips in the spring, daffodils, a lot of them, a lot, right? Prepare the soil. You can't throw the, throw the seeds on concrete. Not what you do. So yeah, I, I hate the language of resilience because it says that this kid carrying clothes home to his mom in their cardboard shack is resilient. No, that's just evil. We want every child to have a decent home because that's what made scarlet fever go away, whooping cough go away, diphtheria go away. That's what made all the diseases go away. And this is what's making all the diseases come back. And what are all the diseases that are coming back? the AIDS epidemic, the crack epidemic, the multi-drug resistant tuberculosis epidemic, the asthma epidemic, and may I say the obesity epidemic. This is what's making all of those diseases come with huge force. And there are so many of them, and they are so new, we don't know how to treat them as physicians. And we cannot get ahead of them. The disease management system cannot manage a system in which we're creating disease. The disease management system can manage a little bit of illness, not massive amounts of new illnesses. It's not made for that. And so therefore, this is why the IOM is saying, we've got to do prevention. And this is why I'm saying, and this is where we got to do it, where we took all the money out of the city, where we acted like the Levite or the priest who passed by the other side. We are the neighbors of this. And our job is to stop and see the wound and put oil and be the Good Samaritan. Do you know those late night commercials? But wait, there's more. <laughs> I always, I, I, I personally, when I talk about this, I get tired about it now. It's like, there's got to be some good news. But wait, no, there's more bad news because what else happened? The United States emerged, think about how short this is. The United States emerges at the end of World War II as the industrial power in the world. Now we don't have any industry. Google is thinking maybe they'll make 100 jobs. M maybe, if it works out. It's not better to do it in China. Some China mugs, period. That's it. So what did we do? And what were we thinking? Why would we go from being the industrial power of the world and just give it away to China? What, we don't need good jobs for Americans? We don't need to make things? So it's just an astounding thing. And this is my hometown, Orange, New Jersey. It used to be a hat-making capital of the world. 4.2 million hats made, this is my neighborhood, 4.2 million hats made in my neighborhood. And now it's just these hulking abandoned factories that we're trying to figure out what to do with. So remember I said, so what happens if you do this over and over again? I didn't go through the whole list. I'm sparing you the whole list. I'm not talking about mass criminalization. I'm not talking about Hope 6 or gentrification foreclosure, which made it worse and worse and worse. So what happens to people that do this? 
that go through this. The, the first is that obviously if you're in the middle of this, it's taking a big toll on you. But here's the point. You can't take out a single neighborhood without injuring the city. So this isn't just happening to the people who are in the neighborhood where it's happening. The, the real way to understand that this is happening is that if this happened in your city of Little Rock, it happened to everybody in Little Rock. If this happened in my city of Orange, New Jersey, it happened to everybody in Orange, New Jersey. An interesting proposition from social psychiatry in my field is that the poor people in an integrated society have better health than the rich people in a disintegrated society. And evidence for that, there was a study of middle class white, not of middle class, of white men, middle aged white men, various income levels, in the US and in Britain. And poor men in Britain had better health than well to do men, white men, in the United States. We do not escape, none of us escapes this trashing of some parts. It, we are a body politic. It's like if I said, oh, I don't like my right arm, I'm gonna cut off the circulation to my right arm and I'll do just fine with one arm and two legs. It's not, not, simply not true. It's a body politic. So in the community, and why is this so devastating, we get fracturing of social bonds. The, the losses are just astronomical. For the people who are actually moved, but for everybody in the system, there's a loss of competitive advantage. So if your city does this, your city is gonna lose competitive advantage to other cities. And for me as a psychiatrist, to me this is the most important actually. It decreases the ability to solve new problems. The groups have to be able to talk to each other. And in order to be able to talk to each other, they have to at some level know each other. And they have to have trust. And if the white people are over here and the black people are over here and the black people are getting moved every 10 years and maybe the white people aren't getting moved as much but there's no coherent black people to talk to, everybody's in a mess. Say there's unemployment in Little Rock. You're gonna have to figure out how you're gonna get some employment, some good employment so people feel secure so that young people have a future here. You gotta be able to talk to each other just as we do in Orange, New Jersey. We gotta be able to talk to each other because we have a big problem. Nobody knows what the economy of the US is gonna be in the 21st century. At the beginning of the 20th century, my grandparents were farmers. There's no farming. My dad was a, worked in, in industry. He was a, a factory worker. There's no more factories. I do service. What are we exporting to China now and India? You think they can't do psychiatry on a telephone from India? They can, they have a manual, they're trying to manualize all the treatments, they have a manual. How are you feeling today? Oh, you're depressed. On a scale of one to 10, how would you rate your depression? Well, may I tell you a few things to do? That's gonna be therapy from, from India. And I'm gonna be out of a job. So, what am I gonna do? I can't retire, I gotta keep working. So we have to talk. It's, uh, you may know some people who are, whose jobs are going to, like, I'm not the only person whose job is going to get exported. They're exporting architecture, they're exporting law. All these high paying service jobs are going to India, China, along with mine. Psychiatry hasn't actually gone yet, I just see the handwriting on the wall. So I'm trying to prepare ahead of time. We have to be able to talk to each other. If you have a very unstable social system, people can't talk to each other. This is devastating. So there's a, a brilliant genius, genius researcher in Pittsburgh called Eva Maria Sims. And she did a study of the Hill District and, and she pointed out that in the period before urban renewal, when Teeny Harris was taking those amazing photos, people really lived in very dense networks where all the adults took care of all the children and they described it as you just lived in your own little world and they took very good care of each other. But as urban renewal came, the social networks were broken apart and people started to, they knew fewer people, there were fewer people they could count on, and they said, you know, there's no clear path that the children had for growing up. By the time that I first got to Pittsburgh in 1997, things had really fallen apart. And one of the people she interviewed called it unexpectancy. That you walk out of your door, you didn't know what was gonna happen. You just hope you'd get back at the end of the day. 
So in, in our modeling of this, this is a model that we proposed in really basically when we first started working on this problem in Harlem in 1993, but we have found it to be a very robust model of this problem. Um, I mean, every city that we've gone to, we, so Sim's work is an affirmation of what we thought. Um, in our own team, Beverly Xavier Watkins worked on this in Harlem. That start off with, at the one end, when you have integration, the great genius of social psychiatry, Alexander Layton, called that the model. He starts to go, you, you do something, you hit it. And it goes down, and it tries to come back up, but it doesn't necessarily get all the way back up. Anyway, you're in a state of confusion in Sims, what, Sim, what Eva Maria Sims called just sort of no clear path. But if you keep doing that, it goes further down on expectancy, what we call disorder. If you keep going, it will eventually get to a point where nothing makes any sense. If you think about Liberia and child soldiers, there's sort of the madness of what can happen to societies caught up in civil war, where even the, the protections on children have all been lost. That, that, I think, is beginning to teach us what nonsense is. Each turn of this, each piece of this collapse is related to these policies that push the poor, that push black people, that push other minorities, that push the vulnerable out of their neighborhoods and into more marginal places. Ripping apart our communities, ripping apart our society. People often say that the problem today is that we don't, and black people say this, I don't know if white people say this, but black people say, oh, it was really better when we had segregation. And of course, the truth is we still have segregation, but we have segregation, what I call segregation without solidarity. No, that's like the worst of all possible worlds. At least if you had segregation, everybody was kind of in it together, you had a little bit of a buffer. But under these conditions of collapse, very, very terrible for people. And this is now part of the black experience. You know, we get to that question, so we had the civil rights movement, we had an astronaut, we had a president, why isn't it perfect? It's not perfect because although we have all the triumphs of the civil rights movement, we've had an ongoing disaster of policies that undermine the functioning of poor communities, minority communities, and our American city. So in the timeline of the, of the black experience, I think it's essential to add urban renewal, deindustrialization, plant shrinkage, and all of these other policies. And for me as a physician, the fundamental pr truth is that we have these policies and then we have these plagues. That's a lot of disease. And we are pumping disease out through the whole nation. These are not confined to the poor neighborhoods in which they start, and indeed to the whole world. So this thesis here is that stability is fundamental to community and community is fundamental to health. And that indeed the, the only treatment is to leave it alone, leave communities alone. Communities need every bit of stability that they can get. But the only way that we're actually gonna begin to leave communities alone is if we neighbor because everybody has to understand that the policies that are being enacted by our government that undermine neighborhoods are disastrous for all of us. It is impossible in a complex society like the United States for it to be simply black people saying, don't disrupt our neighborhoods. White people as well have to understand. Hispanic people have to understand. Asian people have to understand. The very well-to-do have to understand. The very poor have to understand. Everybody has to understand. Because we are, it is only when we are all together, knitted together, however we want to knit ourselves together, it doesn't matter. There are a million ways to knit a society together. But it's only if we're knit together that we will be strong, that we will be able to solve our problems, and that we will have health, real health. Not, not more people, not money to pay to go to the doctor to get a treatment for our diabetes, but actual health. I feel great and I'm gonna go out and garden and I know how to make soil and I'm gonna have a thousand flowers. That's health. So, and, you know, as a psychiatrist, I believe, I believe in talking. 
And I, I believe that, that talking is healing. People have to talk to each other. Um, people say, well, what do we have to do? Well, we, have, we all have to talk to each other. What do we have to talk about? And flowers are a really good way to start. And this is not just because I have a certificate in landscape design from the New York Botanical Garden. Why flowers? I don't even know. But everywhere that people make community gardens, things start to flourish. So there's something about planting. With, and it doesn't matter, they plant corn, they plant tomatoes, they plant roses. Community gardens restore value, they restore values. In New York City, on all the devastated neighborhoods, the ones where people went and planted community gardens, the real estate values went up at a much faster rate than if they didn't. So yeah, let's start. Let, it, I mean, I, I just want to say, this is not to say that what you have to do in Little Rock is plant flowers, but it's a good way to start talking. Because we, if we're going to plant flowers together, we have to have that all important debate. What flower? Now, it could be that this could break the back of the conversation. It could be a deal breaker. I'm for daffodils, you're for roses, end of conversation. Then somebody is going to say, guys, guys, daffodils are in the spring. Roses are a little later. It's OK. We can have both. And they're all going to say, oh, we can have both. And I think that's how you start to make a functional society. It's four seasons, plenty of time for a lot of different flowers. Everybody can have what they want. The vegetable people are a bigger problem, but. <laughs> Have you noticed how they want to take over everything, the vegetable people? You have to be careful. We, we have hypothesized that there is such a thing as, as uh, Sims 4. Eva Maria Sims didn't write about this, but I've started to see it in Pittsburgh. And it's what I'm writing about in my new book. This, this it looks kind of a lot the same as Sims 3, but prettier starting to get prettier, people are smiling a little bit more, a little bit less crazy. And I've proposed that we call it, it it's starting to make sense. If, if we start to talk to each other, it will start to make sense again. So this is all about this comment from Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr that we're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. The Good Samaritan knew that. And that's why he stopped. He would have been impoverished if he went by and let that guy die. He knew he would feel sad. His life would be ruined. And, and it's that, it's that, it's that knowing that I could be selfish, I could just think about me. And I could think that by me thinking about me, I'm going to be rich. But it turns out, it doesn't matter whether you read it in the Bible or you read it in the Journal of the American Medical Association. If you just think about you and you think that's how you're going to be rich, you're going to get poor. What country is more selfish than the United States of America right now? What country is spending more of its money on disease management than the United States of America? We are called to neighbor like we mean it, if we want to save our country. So what does that mean? What does neighbor like you mean it mean? I don't, I'm not really imposing that to you as, as the question we have to talk about. But I believe it means that the guy you don't know is bleeding, and he's not your tribe. But you know that it will impoverish you if you walk on by. And therefore, you stop. And you take money out of your pocket. And you say to whoever has to fix it, I'll be back, and I'll give you more money if you need it. That's neighboring like you mean it. In my medical school, they had a plaque. And it was all the doctors who had died in a yellow fever epidemic all the medical students who had died in a yellow fever epidemic treating the victims of the plague. And at the bottom, it said, go forth and do thou likewise. And I've tried to be a doctor that would go to the yellow fever epidemic, like, but I'm scared. I don't want to die in the yellow fever epidemic. 
I, said, I, I really was like, I used to look at that thing every day when I was a medical student. So, do I have to die to be a good doctor? I was afraid. And I, and I had to learn that, yeah, I might. I might have to die to be a good doctor. And that was my charge. That was, that was if, if I was going to be a doctor, it was a sacred duty. And I had to be willing to go forth and do likewise. And I think that's what it means to neighbor like you mean it. And I hope you'll join me in being very serious about saving lives. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. We do have time for just one or two questions before we uh, go out tonight and talk to our neighbors. Um, anyone have anything to ask? You can keep it short? Okay. Annie. <laughs> Annie. The reason why I'm first is because I was scheduled to go show you where all of the people who died because of those policy changes, all of those things, your schedule has changed, so I don't have to do that. But it was a reminder. If I look at this crowd, and I know just about most of them, if this was a house of worship, and you were the preacher as you were tonight, how many houses of worship needs to hear the message that you have tonight? And how many houses of public policy need to hear it? And then how many citizens? You know, I think we're all afraid all the time. And racism is an illusion that it's, it's something dirty about the other person. If I just don't go near the other person, it's all gonna be okay. And so the black people won't go near the white people, and, white, and you know, the, the Asian people and the Hispanic people, they all join in the system and say, well, if I just don't go near them, it'll all be okay. If they just stay over there, if, they, if somebody just does something, it'll all be okay. And, and so in, in psychiatry, when we think about racism, we think about this illusion and, and we think of it but certainly the black psychiatrists and the Hispanic psychiatrists, we, we all think of it as a, you know, really a, a mental disorder that we think this way. It's a wrong thinking. And we have to get out of this wrong thinking, but it's really scary. Because what if, what if she's really the problem because she has on a yellow shirt and I go near her? It's like the yellow fever, right? I gotta be brave enough to, to, to go near her and shake her hand. I, I gotta have that courage. We, we are all called upon to have courage. And we are all afraid, and so we take this message with fear and trembling, um, but with faith that um, we're not alone, and it's our best hope. Last question, Judge Griffin. Wait for the microphone. Dr. Fulove, your presentation has profound public policy and ethical implications. Here's the question. How many public policy bodies invite you before they think about putting places in communities that are disrupted to talk? Or how many of them invite social psychiatrists to talk about this before they do root shock? Well, I'm kind of working my way up from the grassroots. <laughs> I'll get there. <laughs> I didn't get there yet. I was sharing that um, uh, when my, so my book Root Shock is about tearing up neighborhoods and how it hurts America. And I work at I'm on the faculty of Columbia University, which took a huge giant section of Harlem to make a new campus. And so there was a review written for one of the Columbia publications by a, a very outstanding scholar at another institution. And at the end of her review of my book, she said, and perhaps Columbia should think about this as they're proposing to snatch all this land. And uh, so the review was suppressed. And there's been, never been any mention of my book in all the usual places faculty work gets mentioned at Columbia. So I'm kind of on the outside knocking on the door. And if you have any doors you want to open for me, I'm glad to come and tell them that they should be like the Good Samaritan and not like the priest that walked on the other side. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.